Hey, Matt. Hey, how are you, Kenny? How's it going this afternoon, bro? Is that going to be a... Um, so other people on live, could you let us know if you can hear his audio? We're kind of Jimmy rigging things. I just wonder if it's going to be feedback and if that's... Feeding. Yeah. Um, How's the audio, guys? Can you let us know if audio is clear? Why is there always an issue every time we do that? I don't know. <laughs> it's Nicole. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Jimmy, is Jimmy Rigg uh, a technical term? And is that in Webster's Dictionary, actually, Jimmy Rigg? you, you got to a... be from Idaho to say that. Okay, it looks like they, people are saying <laughs> we can hear them both. So okay. it, it sounds okay. It's good. Cool. All right, we're going to get started. Matt, uh, first of all, can, Kenny, how you doing, man? Good, man. Good. How are you, brother? How are you? Grinding it out, bro. Grinding it out. I Beautiful know. Sunday. Good, good so to hear your voice again. Um, I, I, I guess, it, can you just give your, your background real quick for everybody, you know, where you're from, sure. what, what your, what your uh, experience is, all that stuff? Absolutely. Yeah, I've been in, I started my 29th year in law enforcement. Uh, I was with a small suburban police department for the, for the majority of my career right outside of Cleveland, Ohio for 27 years. Uh, the last uh, 15 of those were in administration. Don't hold that against me. The last six were I was the chief of police for the department. I've been in, uh, in, involved in law enforcement, uh, perishable skill training too for, for about 20 years. Um, and uh, the, uh, I retired officially on paper uh, and I've been for the last uh, year and a half I've been with a um, Northeastern Ohio uh, Narcotic Law Enforcement uh, Task Force, Drug Task Force now uh, for the last 18 months. So, awesome. still, in the, and still in the game. So Awesome. So, so Matt, you, you had us out uh, to Ohio, what is it, about a month now, a month, a month ago now. Um, first of all, why, why did you have Argus out there? And, uh, why did you have Argus out there? And, um, and what was your experience, uh, I guess, learning from us and going over all the different things that we went over? Yeah, you know, it was uh, kind of kind of serendipitous how we, we, we came across each other's paths. You know, Jared, um, uh, I, I've known Jared since I taught him in the police academy. Uh, then he uh, he actually met my son at a birthday party, and then we hooked up. He said, come on down to Charlotte. So me and my son uh, packed up, went down there, met you fine folks, and, um, you know, Nicole and Jared and Al. And uh, just uh, I saw what you guys were doing with concealment uh, with the, uh, the Pujitsu program. Uh, amalgamating, um, you know, martial arts, comma, jujitsu, comma, Greco-Roman style techniques um, with gunfighting. Um, and that amalgamation, I think, in my humble opinion, there's a huge nebulous void or vacuum for law enforcement training. Uh, I, I can't speak on behalf of the other country, but at least in Northeast Ohio, at least I believe so, being a, uh, an LA trainer for, for 20 years. Um, and I really liked what I saw. I thought it was... Um, gross motor based um, and, uh, you know, able to perform under stress, which which is everything, um, you know, based on some of the precepts and fundamentals of jujitsu and Greco-Roman wrestling, which I think that's very important as well. You know, when, when you know, getting to your gun, if you have nobody in your grill and throwing punches at you or has mounted you, um, um, you know, is very difficult. And then if you have time to get to it, it's even more important. So you have to, what's important now? You know, that, that's, a, that's a big principle I'm sure you guys also sub subscribe to. Um, you know, it's great to get your gun if you can, right. uh, but uh, you got to create that space to get to it when you can. That, that's, you know, as, as equally important, I believe. Absolutely. And, and again, you know, our focus is always trying to make it um, as simple as possible without compromising uh, quality or effectiveness. Um, and hopefully you, you guys and, and your fellow uh, law enforcement uh, guys that attended uh, agreed with that or able to at least take a lot of that uh, stuff to heart. Uh, absolutely. You know, I got, uh, you know, uh, you know, you, you know, bringing you guys up and, you know, pack, pack it up and bring the band up here, so to speak, for to Cleveland, Ohio was cool. Um, you know, I know it was the first thing for you guys. And, uh, you know, I got nothing. And this is no, no BS, Kenny. Uh, the 99% of the people that went through that course walked away with something that was an aha moment for them. And I think, once again, when you're training like that, when you have, when you, when you have that uh, reality-based training situation where you're, when you're in a car or you're outside of a car, or, or in those um, those enclosed spaces like we were in that in that one facility, that one building, um, and you have somebody in your grill and you have somebody throwing punches at you and, 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 and grabbing onto you, and you're trying to get to your gun, but you can't, and you have to then use those frames that you guys taught to create that space to get to your gun, and then shooting, when you, when you have the gun, you, you, you are shooting in positions that you never, ever even think about shooting on the range at a static target staying stationary uh yet that's what a lot of the people did i think those were a lot of the aha moments that those those attendees had from your from the Argus class those two days that's great to hear um 
Matt, so I, my, my understanding is that you had an experience recently where you, you actually had to use uh, a technique or a couple of the techniques that we went over uh, at the seminar. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, you know, when I say it was simplistic in nature, it, you know, the, the end result was, of course, it could have been real nasty. Excuse me. So me and another um, detective, we were in a plain clothes vehicle, and uh, we were in plain clothes as well. And um, we just got done uh, making a, a narcotics transaction. We were going to go and meet up with a couple of the other undercover officers and detectives uh, just to have a little bit of uh, uh, to the fat and, and, and meet up about the, the deal. And so we're, we're going to a, a shopping center and we're in the right turn lane waiting for the red to turn green. And then the, uh, there was uh, some other the northbound traffic was coming and they had the green light, the right of way to turn left in front of us. And this guy. I don't know what his deal was, but he uh, he came real close to hitting our front vehicle for no reason. We were not impeding traffic. We were just making the way to right. We were waiting to make the right after the the right of way left hand turn lane clear, and he came within probably a foot foot and a half of our front bumper, and we have no idea why. Um, so we then went behind him and got in traffic behind him, and he decided then to veer slowly off to the left, stop his car, and he exited his vehicle extremely quickly from the driver's side. I'm in the passenger front seat. Uh, my partner, the other detective you see, is in the in the driver's seat of the UC, and he gets out, and he gets out in a semi-staggered fighting stance and lifts his shirt up from the center line like this as if he was going to be extracting and getting a weapon. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, I had to, you know, I, my belt was on. I had to get my hand underneath like you guys did, but from the driver's position we trained. Uh, get the belt off, and then manipulate my clothing. I wear it at 3 o'clock right now. I'm considering going to appendix, but when you're sitting in a car doing a lot of surveillance like I do, appendix can be a little problematic. But nonetheless, I manipulated my clothing like we trained in the class two to get that get that shirt and get that clothing and get the gun in the fight as quickly as possible. And just like in a uh, in-person gun situation, if somebody presents a, a firearm you know, to your face, you want to get offline. So the, the driver, he, he got offline. He's been around. Um, needless to say, uh, we did find that gentleman, and uh, you know we ended up suppressing the vehicle. Uh, luckily, there was no gun on him or in the vehicle. Um, the resolution was he was having a quote unquote a bad day. Um, you know, drugs were involved with him and the female passenger. But uh, you know, it, it just went back and right after that. You know, it's like wow, we just went over something very similar in the Argus class. Uh, you know earlier that month or later that month. So it brought things home very, very quickly. And just once again, you know, 29 years in, man, you don't, you don't ever want to get complacent. You know, at times you're going to, no matter how tactical, no matter what kind of mindset you have, no matter where, you know, you're in condition yellow, you try to be a software all the time, but it just went to show me again that you just never, never know. And that the epicenter of being able to respond effectively as you can uh, uh, and physically as you can uh, comes down to your training. I mean, that, that really does come down to your training. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and I'm glad, obviously, that everyone is safe uh, in that encounter. Um, but uh, very interesting and very cool to hear that, you know, your, your training kicked in, you know. It, it's interesting because, obviously, there's the mental component, right, of, of being able to execute when you need to. But also there's the actual technique of, you know, doing things that are going to make you more efficient and more effective. Um, yeah. And I always find that to be, they are almost one in the same. Like it's the technique that leads to the mental capacity to execute and also the mental capacity that allows for the technical aspects to, to really follow through as well. So I think those things are almost one in the same. Is that the way that you kind of see it? Uh, absolutely. I think that those, those factors you just alluded to uh, are all connected. They're all symbiotic. And once again, too, you have to, it, we don't do a lot of it in law enforcement for, for various reasons. It's scheduling, it's time, it's overtime. It, it's officers really not wanting to because they don't want to. They don't want to embrace their vulnerability and look look uh, look like they're poor performers in front of their colleagues. But you really have to pressure test yourself. You have to pressure test whatever technique, whatever system, quote unquote. I hate using that word that you subscribe to. Whatever myriad or facet of law enforcement, whether it's physical skills and your your subject control, your firearms, um, you have to pressure test it. You have to pressure test yourself. You have to test your metal under stressful situations to, to see how really you are going to react. And then when you're making some mistakes, you can reevaluate 
reassess, and then make those tweaks where you need to. So hopefully if you do have to perform under those somewhat similar stressful circumstances in a real life scenario, you're not going to be too far behind the eight ball and that brain's going to have that mental blueprint that it should have done while you were doing those uh, pressure tested reality based training scenarios. If that makes sense, Ken. Yeah, well said. Absolutely. Well, Matt, man, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, you know, I know you have a lot of other things to do. So I thank you for coming on and talking to us and sharing that story. Um, it, it's great to hear that everything uh, was, was okay and, and you guys are all safe. And um, yeah, just appreciate your time. And uh, it was great to see you about a month ago. Yeah, well, Case, right back at you and you guys from Argus. You guys were fantastic. I hope to bring you up to Cleveland, Ohio again. Hopefully see you at the OTOA. And for all my fellow law enforcement brothers and sisters out there listening today, man, I wish you the very best. Stay safe. God bless Sector 6. See you, Matt. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Do not take any questions? Cool. Yeah, well, we got a few more minutes. If you guys want to ask any questions, we are happy to, to take them. We, we had one comment earlier where they said all law enforcement needs to train jujitsu. Uh, does all, all law enforcement? The state just stating that all law enforcement oh, yeah. needs to train I mean, jujitsu. Yeah, listen, I, I, I think, um, yes, that's true. But I also think that it's important to train the right type of jujitsu, mm -hmm. right? There, I came up in an era where there wasn't a whole lot of jujitsu. Uh, now there's a lot of jujitsu. Um, but with that, it doesn't mean that that is always going to equate to the most effective approach for self-defense, for, um, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat or, or a, a, a scenario where you have to fight for your life. I think anything is going to be better than nothing, no question about it. But I think having the right approach to training and utilizing your jiu-jitsu or whatever martial arts uh, skills you have in the right way is super important. What are some of the criteria you give people when they're looking for a good place to train in their area? I think first and foremost, that's a great question, I think is getting getting the right vibe from the school, going out there and making sure that that's a school that um, is about getting you to want to learn and improve, that it's not about the instructor or, you know, the people that are there, um, you know, proving how badass they are. Um, <clears throat> I, I think, you know, being at a good competitive school is great too. guys that are competing and got guys that are, you know, I think that's, there's a lot of value in there because you're going to get tougher. You're going to learn to get better, but uh, making sure that it's the right environment for you, that it's um, an environment where you'll be able to learn, where you're going to be challenged um, and you'd be pushed to get better. Uh, that's, that's super important. Uh, sometimes, you know, you can be in a kind of a weird uh, culture or a weird school cultish like uh, school environment which which is not healthy uh, so I think that the main thing is if you're going to go check it if you're going to go to a school first go check it out try a class or two for free most academies have that ability um, and ask ask the students ask around ask people who are have been a part of the school you know get get more than just one opinion um, uh, you know just to kind of vet your school and then uh, from there uh, try it out yeah, if they won't give you a week free, don't sign up there. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, Julio Chiu, I think, looking good, Professor. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, Animus Libertas says, give us another Nate Diaz impression, Kenny. <laughs> 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 he has lots of good impressions. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, someone asked a question. It's kind of like that. What was that discovery show? Like who would win between a shark and a grizzly bear? Uh, yeah. They're wondering if someone armed but doesn't train martial arts is more dangerous or less dangerous than someone unarmed that trains martial arts. That That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so what's the, I guess a lot of it depends on what's the level of their shooting experience. What's the level of, you know, uh, their mental capacity to stay composed when they need to. Um, straight off the bat, obviously, a gun is a fight ender, right? <laughs> like, you get hit with a bullet, uh, you know, in the wrong place, it's, it's going to go bad. It's going to go bad. Um, you know, uh, a person who is skilled in fighting, uh, while they could potentially kill you, um, it doesn't always go down that way. So as far as the levels of danger, obviously, a firearm is going to be, you know, on the, on the highest order of, of, of danger. But just like, you know, not all practitioners are created equal, not all uh, shooters are, are created equal either. So uh, it all just takes consistent training and being pushed uh, in ways that you're typically not used to. So 
you know, anytime you can make your training uh, realistic or you can put yourself under pressure, you get a good handle on how you would potentially uh, handle a situation when you actually need it. Uh, because it's all well and good to drill moves and to shoot a, a still target or to train with your buddies at the gym. It's quite another thing to have to defend yourself uh, for real, especially like the different levels. Like there's, um, you know, someone grabs your, you know, someone grabs your wife's purse. Or someone pushes uh, a friend of yours. There's a fight that breaks out. There's, um, you know, 10 on 10 uh, people thrown down. There's a knife involved. There's a gun involved, you know, distance. You know, all those things change the dynamic completely. And I, I would say, you know, me, myself, with, with whatever I, I was doing before, I mean, how much, how much of that was I doing, you know, even when I was a professional fighter? I was just dealing with, you know, dealing with another guy in a cage in a controlled environment. But we forget that um, there is a lot of chaos in self-defense situations, and, and we don't have a whole lot of control there. Um, how do you prepare for those things? Prepare for it all. You know, if you want to be um, a person who really knows how to defend yourself, it's like, hey, get familiar with weapons, really train hard. You know, what are you doing to prepare yourself, uh, really? Um, so, and, and, and just being, you know, how do you, how do you run through a house and clear rooms? You know, if someone is in your house, someone has broken in, what's your discipline to not shoot the right per not shoot the wrong person? You know, there, there's so much that goes into it. And for me, um, it, that always made me uncomfortable. And, uh, I've learned to try to run towards, um, you know, that fear and, and try to familiarize myself with all those different scenarios and make sure that um, I, I don't make those mistakes when, when I really can't afford to do them. So <clears throat> I hear out of all the things you're saying, no matter what they're training, that they need to train decision making. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it, right? That, that is a big part of, it, uh, of anything. So you can have all the best techniques in the world. Um, if you're not making the right decisions, um, yeah, you, you, can, you can be in big trouble, both in the experience that you have and, and how you're able to lead someone into um, your strengths, right? Or, or to have a little bit more control uh, swung, you know, to have that pendulum swung your way a little bit more, or just, um, you know, not freaking out and just throwing away your training and just going nuts, you know? We see it even with people who are police officers, military, you know, shooting the wrong person, getting overly excited, um, you know, letting the moment take them over. It, it's something that was really powerful for me in my first official UFC fight in the finals of the Ultimate Fighter. I, I'll never forget it, of me being like a deer in the headlights. That was something I never experienced, that level of anxiety and nervousness and fear. Um, and it was that moment that I was like, okay, well, I need to make sure that I address this in, in all ways possible. So um, I also think, right, it's your training that is also going to give you that composure but um you have to be aware of of what your tendencies are do you get overly excited do you not are you you know too relaxed when you actually need to be turned on and ready so everyone's different and, and um, i think the best way to do that is just familiarizing yourself getting to know yourself through training and getting pushed by the best people you can find awesome um that julius chi says how often should you train gi versus no gi julius Throw the gi out, burn it, burn it, <laughs> put it in a bonfire, throw some gasoline, cheer. No, uh, gear, you know, the chaining of the gi is fine. Um, I, I, I don't think I took my gi off until I was a brown belt. Uh, now, if you ask me how often I train gi, not very much, uh, maybe a few times a year. Um, and I, I like gi. It's fun. It's cool. But it's really easy to kind of game the process and do things that are so far out of the realm of like what real martial arts or self-defense is that you can get a little crazy with it. If you are a, a sport competitor and you train in the gi, then yeah, shit, you should be training in the gi all the time. Um, but if you're training in the gi thinking like I'm preparing to defend myself now and I'm doing all these crazy grips and things, it better off than not. But also, don't get it twisted that you're going to be, you know, this master of self-defense all of a sudden because, you know, you know how to do lasso guard. Uh, you know, it's just, yeah. yeah good point. Um, request from Nick Lacey to come to San Diego uh, doing seminar and vacation. San Diego is pretty damn beautiful, so yeah. we will not say no to that. We That's would not love, a we would hard sell. It's it? not a hard sell. <laughs> but any, anyone who's interested, guys, if you guys ever want to 
uh, hit us up and you're interested in having us come out for a seminar. Uh, you know, we've been booking things already for 2023. So if you guys are interested in having us come out, just contact us. Uh, hit us up at argusintegrateddefense.com. Um, hit us up on Instagram uh, and, and we will get back to you and see if we can set things up. So uh, we, we love training with new people. I feel like this is a, um, an aspect that is kind of ignored. Uh, and hopefully we can kind of bridge that gap and, and help you guys out, especially for those that are, you know, into, into firearms, those that are into jiu-jitsu and martial arts. Like, I think it's a, it's a perfect blend. And I think there's some real eye-opening training that I think uh, we can expose you to, to, to really help out. And um, I know I'm having a blast doing, doing it and learning as much as possible. And, and we'd love to share that information with you. Awesome. So I have a good closer. It's um, by Leffingwell 18th. Okay. Ken Flo, what's your inspiration behind training with firearms and focusing on self-defense? Jeez, great question. Um, yeah, I'll take this as the last one. Um, I just, I, I don't want to be exposed in any way, shape, or form, right? It's like, I think it's important in today's world where we're seeing more and more violence break out, um, you know, I believe that we need to adapt ourselves and evolve for whatever's happening out there. Um, and the odds are that, hey, maybe we don't have to use it, but um, everything about martial arts is about preparation and training just in case. Um, uh, but we're seeing a lot of these different scenarios. I mean, whether it's like this horrible school violence or, you know, some kind of violence out in the street, people are having hard times and there's more mental health issues than ever. Uh, and my sense is it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And I don't want to be a victim and yeah, cool. I know how to do some jujitsu and I know how to do some fighting, but I don't know how to block a bullet. I don't know how to, how to slip a bullet. Uh, um, so I, I need to prepare for whatever the environment, um, you know, is. And, and, and I feel like, um, you know, I, I don't want to feel, uh, overwhelmed or, um, and literally outgunned out there. So I, I, my, my goal is always to try to um, get as good as possible with whatever it is I'm doing. And I felt like I was at a point where I could now focus on, on firearms and then, you know, think about, all right, how do we put this all together? Similar to how people were doing this with mixed martial arts back in the day. You know, originally it was karate versus jiu-jitsu or wrestling versus this. And people started realizing, wait a sec, we kind of need to know it all. Well, there's one element that's missing and it's weapons, you know, whether it's knife, gun, all that stuff, you need to prepare for all those things. It's a crazy world out there. Um, prepare for it all. Why not? And also, I just, I just love it. I, I find it really interesting. I love the problem solving. And um, it, uh, it's, I love working on new things. So that, that's my motivation. Okay, this is up to you, but Animus Libertus was asked for the third time. He says, great oh. answers, but can you please do an ADS? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, make it over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, to tell, ADS is best in the world. <laughs> Two or nine. What? All right, that's it. That's all I got. That's all I got. I love the Diaz brothers, okay? So stop. My one of my best my best boys is George St. Pierre. I do uh hey Kenny, how are you doing? It's George St. Pierre. I, I make fun of him all the time. So Diaz brothers, just chill. I love you guys. You guys you guys are awesome. It's all good. It's all good. I love you guys. All right, so you guys, thank you guys so much.